You're listening to episode 52 of the Journey to Launch podcast, finding adventure and happiness on your way to early retirement with Tanya from Our Next Life. T minus 10 seconds. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in, in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 journeyers. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. So happy to have you here with me. And I'm excited today to talk to Tanya, Tanya Hester from Our Next Life. So if you're already in the financial independence community, if you've been following it for a bit, you might know of Tanya and her story. She's from the blog Our Next Life and her and her husband became financially independent and have retired early. So she's pretty, for the most part, well known in this space, but I wanted to bring her on because I know that some of you guys listening The FI movement is pretty new to you. You might have never heard of her before, but this is someone you should get to know. And here's why. Tanya became financially independent at the age of 36 and retired early at the age of 38. And so despite never being a super saver and she wasn't even naturally good with money, she was able to get on track and accomplish such a big feat. She writes at the award-winning financial independence and early retirement blog, Our Next Life, and it chronicles her and her husband Mark's journey to early retirement. And so they did that in 2017. The blog, Our Next Life, has quickly grown into to be a fixture in the FIRE space, earning spots on Rockstar Finance, Best Blogs list, winning at the 2017 Plutus Awards, and it continues to get just high honors from the personal finance community. In addition to blogging, Tanya also has the Fairer Sense podcast. So if you remember, I actually had her co-host, Cara Perez, on episode 49. So together, they do the Fairer Sense podcast, which you should totally check out. If you want to go back and listen to her co-host, Cara's interview, which was really good, go to episode 49. In my talk today with Tanya, we're going to discuss a few things, how she reached FI what caused her to start the plan and how she managed to keep it a secret from her job. So if you followed her on the journey, you saw that she never showed her face. She kept her identity private the whole time while she was blogging and chronicling her journey. And then we're going to talk about what retirement actually means to her and how someone who's looking to do what she's done, what they should do, what they should consider and implement in their lives and so much more. This is going to be a really good conversation Also, if you want the episode show notes, go to journeytolaunch.com slash episode 52. And before we get into it, I wanted to just say, if you're enjoying the podcast, please continue to share and tell your family and friends. That's the biggest and best way you can help me and the podcast out by getting more people to learn about it, to listen to it. So continue to share it on your social media, on your private Facebook feed, just tell a friend and tell them to tell a friend. Also, if you are listening to this in Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. That really helps with getting the podcast more out there. Also, if you want to keep in touch, don't forget you can follow me on all social media. That's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Journey to Launch. Also, Join the private Facebook group at journeytolaunch.com slash community. Let's connect some more. All right, so let's get into this conversation with Tanya. Hi, Journeyers. I am so excited to have Tanya Hester from Our Next Life, the blog, on the podcast. Hi, Tanya. Hi, I'm so happy to talk to you. Yes, I mean, I've been a fan of your work and your honesty in the financial independence movement and just general personal finance. I love your blog. I love everything you stand for. So I thought this was perfect that you come on the podcast. You share more about yourself to my listeners who might not have heard of you before or are just a little bit more unfamiliar with you. And then there might be some people who know of you because you're pretty popular in the space that maybe we'll just touch upon some things that they haven't heard yet or just get to know you better too. Wow. Well, thank you so much for all of that. I'm, <laughs> 
You completely made my day. Oh, so you have accomplished a lot. I mean, there's so much to talk about and get into with your story. And you basically retired by 40 years old. You and your husband, right? Yeah. You can explain what retired means, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm actually 38 and we retired at the end of last year. So I beat 40 by just a little bit. And when did you start your journey? Like at what age? When we really got serious about saving for early retirement specifically and not just toward kind of general financial goals, I was 32 and Mark was 35. So our primary savings phase was really only about six years. But having said that, we were certainly not starting from scratch at that point. We'd already been out of debt for several years. We had been in a good habit of saving to buy our first place and then our second place. And we had some retirement savings already since we were in our 30s. So that's not starting from zero. I think in total, it probably would have taken us about 10 years if we had started from scratch. But yeah, once we really got focused, it went remarkably quickly. And I actually like that you mentioned that you didn't start from scratch or zero because I find that if you don't preface the sentence or the journey with where you started, it's hard. Like when you say, okay, I reached it in eight years or five or six years, that's a pretty quick timeline Mm -hmm. for a lot of people. So people who are just finding out about financial independence and they want to start their journey, they sometimes are starting with more of a deficit, right? They have student loans or Mm -hmm. they have these things they need to work through. So I like just acknowledging the fact that my starting point is a little bit further along. And let's not forget about income, which we'll get into, which obviously the more you make, the more you can save. Oh, a hundred percent. And just to give a little example of the difference there, we saved in about six years, but I recently unearthed an old financial statement that I had made for myself. And about 10 years ago, about 10 years before retiring, I had a net worth of just about zero. I had just gotten out of debt. I had some student loans. I had a car loan that I financed a new car, a hundred percent, no down payment. I had some credit card debt. So I had a little of all of that, but it was just about 10 years ago that I had broken even. So between then and six years ago, though, there was plenty of progress. That was when Mark and I got married. We started combining our finances. So yeah, I'm so with you. I think people need to acknowledge the little boost that you might've gotten or that just saying, okay, we saved for six years doesn't tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. And I think you just brought up another good point, having a partner who is on board where you can combine your finances. Sure, you'll also need more money if you combine everything together. If you're looking at the total number you might need. But if that person also has a good income and good practices, that can also accelerate the journey. A hundred percent. Plus, there are just so many economies of scale on things. You know, if I was trying to buy a smaller home just for me, it would certainly cost more than 50% of what our house cost. And so we save a ton on housing and on utilities. There are ways that being together saves us money on groceries and travel. So lots and lots of ways we benefit from being together, which isn't to say that single people can't become financially independent. But I do think we for sure got here faster going together. Mm -hmm. And I can totally relate because part of the reason why we're able to save so much is because he's on board and then he has access to all these nice retirement accounts or additional one that helped us hyper drive our pre-tax retirement savings. All right, let's jump in a little bit. I'm curious to know, I mean, you said 10 years ago, you were starting at zero. So in your 20s, were you always just good with finances or maybe you just, (laughs) or not really? I'm trying to get to your mindset to where you even were in a position to not start so far behind in your 30s. Yeah, no, I I laughed just because I definitely (laughs) wasn't. I think there is probably an idea that you have to be like a natural super saver or just naturally on top of everything to be able to retire early or become financially independent or even just build some flexibility into your life. And I definitely didn't start there. I mean, I wasn't bad with money in the sense that I didn't understand it. I got a good personal finance education at home growing up. I knew how to balance a checkbook. I knew what credit cards were and weren't and all of that stuff. But I made some pretty dumb decisions. My student loan actually from college was just because I didn't want to work freshman year. I actually had a full ride scholarship and I still came out with debt because 
I didn't do what I needed to do to pay for the little bit of overage my freshman year. And then some of the credit card debt I had was basic stuff like when I came out of school and earned a very entry level salary in Washington, D.C. at the time, which is expensive. Some of it was like buying groceries, but a lot of it was also buying clothes and shoes to look the part at work that I probably didn't need to spend or like, oh, Target was my worst trigger for a long time. I finally had to accept that I just don't get to go to Target because every time I went in there, I came out with like a shopping cart full of home stuff that I didn't need. And then I already told you about buying that car. So I for sure made plenty of decisions. I went to lots of happy hours I should not have gone to. I should have saved that money instead. But I think that I was lucky in the sense that those mistakes were somewhat contained to a time in my life when I was earning relatively little. And then as my income climbed, I was able to get out of that debt and then really see the value in doing that and putting money toward paying that off and having more flexibility. And then it really lined up to when Mark and I got married that we decided we really wanted to save aggressively. Part of it was at the time we were living in LA and you just can't buy anything there even when we were looking, which was right after the housing crash in 2008 and 2009, even then you still needed to have just a ton of money saved to be able to buy anything. So we got on board pretty quickly at that point with saving, but it was definitely not something that I took to instantly. You had your own, it seemed, awakening about your finances previous to Mark. What was driving that? Was it just you realized, okay, I just should be doing better at this point? It's a little hard to put myself back in that mindset now. It's possible I've blocked some of that out. But I remember just how bad I felt a lot of the time carrying around the weight of that debt. And I think it was really recognizing that. And then when I got out of debt, really noticing how much lighter and happier I felt and how much easier it was just to go through life every day, not carrying around this huge weight on my shoulders. And in the scheme of things, my debt wasn't massive. It was about $30,000 at the peak. But I was also earning just barely more than that per year. So it still felt massive. But I think recognizing the struggle of carrying that around and then how much better I felt when it was gone really convinced me that I could even feel better and better if in addition to paying off the debt, I could also save some money and be in a position where if I ever felt like I needed to quit my job, I could afford to. Or if I needed to move, I could afford to do that. Or if someone I loved needed help, I could help them. And so it really just became kind of a self-fulfilling thing once I realized how good all of those steps felt. And it really is true. Each step along the way, as we've improved our finances, it's just removed stress that in some cases we didn't even know we were carrying around. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you, as you started to make more money, it was just a good thing because you were able to now optimize and do better with your finances. I'm curious to know when you said you made 30,000, as you eventually started making more money, was it that you switched careers or you just moved up the chain where you worked? By the end of my career, I was definitely earning well into six figures, but I actually never changed jobs at all. I worked the same job from within a year of graduating college until I retired at the end of last year. So 16 years in total at that job. And it was really just incremental raises. So I never even got like a huge bump. I got several promotions over that time, but none of them came with any massive jump up. So I always like to say it's proof that compounding doesn't just work with savings. It also works with your income. You might think three, four percent at a time in those jumps doesn't add up, but oh my goodness, it for sure does. You know what? That's such a good point. We'll talk about income and sharing numbers too a little bit later, but when I first graduated college, I graduated making 55000 which I don't even know how many years ago was that. Like 12 years ago, it wasn't that bad. But just like you, I've been with the same company working my way up and small incremental raises every year over year, which has gotten me to six figures. And I feel like totally relatable to what you're saying about not being that astute or optimal with your finances in your 20s. I was the same way. I didn't, I didn't make huge mistakes, but I could have did so much better. But luckily for me, as I started to make more money and I didn't make the larger mistakes that come with making more money, I ask these questions because I know a lot of my listeners are in probably positions where maybe they're not making as much as they'd like. They want to get to six figures. And so sometimes it is a matter of understanding the scope of your career trajectory that you're currently in. Is there a possibility to make more money in a few years or is there a stop? Is there a ceiling where perhaps you need to change careers and think about something different depending on your time horizon for retirement. 
Yeah, I think that's such good advice. And that is one thing that I for sure knew. I was an English major, so I am not one of the tech or IT engineers who I think we hear from a lot who are able to retire early. So total liberal arts person. I knew I wasn't going to make a lot of money coming out of college. And to be honest, in college, I didn't really think about making money, which looking back, I kind of want to go like, hey, maybe give that a little thought. But I did know working for my company that I was going to have good earnings potential there. And so I loved the company. I loved the people. I loved the work. I loved the clients. I mean, there was really a lot that I enjoyed about it. But I also wouldn't have stuck around if I thought I was going to stay at the same money forever. I knew that was going to grow. And I think it's important for everybody to kind of know that in your job or your career. And if you're in a position where it's not likely to grow, figure out what steps you can take to get into a better position for yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, can I ask what job or what field you went into with a liberal arts degree that eventually earned you six figures? I had been a journalist for a very brief time. That was what I really wanted to do. But there were no jobs in that when I moved to D.C. in 2001. And then the terrorist attack happened and the economy kind of crashed there. So I ended up going more private sector. I actually worked as my main career as a political communications consultant. And some of it was exciting and sort of what you might imagine. A lot of it wasn't. <laughs> and a lot of it was kind of promoting good causes. So not always political candidates, but sometimes, you know, trying to fight for healthcare reform or education reform or things that are sort of just basic issue causes, but are a little bit more politically aligned. And thanks for sharing that, because I know there are a lot of people who have graduated with liberal arts degrees and are in tons of debt and are not making a lot of money. And there are other positions and jobs that maybe they're not thinking about that can earn them more money. Just have to do your research. For sure. And I do think anything that tends to have clients is going to have good earning potential long term. But often those types of jobs do start you out a lot lower. They sort of have like a mentality of you have to pay your dues. So I for sure paid my dues for several years. But then over time, again, just simple compounding really does add up. But also if you show that you're committed and willing to work hard and do a good job and clients like you, you can do well for sure in consulting career tracks. Good advice. Okay, so now you and Mark meet, you get married, and now you together are thinking about better life or your next life, which is your mm-hmm. <laughs> your blog. So is it just coincidence that you kind of met someone who also was open to it? Was he also thinking about this too? Or how did you guys merge this and create a plan together to reach this goal? It is funny. On our very first date, he asked me how much I earned and told me how much he earned, which I I think was his way of just saying like, oh, don't worry, I'm going to pay for this meal. (laughs) But it did put us on, I think, a footing of being very open with each other about money really from the absolute beginning, which has been such a gift to our relationship. But no, I would not say we were at all in the place of wanting to save all our money and do this. What we were very aligned on from the beginning, and one of the things that really drew us to each other was that he also did political consulting. We both sensed that even though we worked in these very high stress career paths where the good thing is people really care deeply about the work in those cases. You know, nobody does that kind of work without really, really caring about the result. And so you're dealing with all these passionate people, but the flip side is you're expected to give it your absolute all and to be reachable essentially every second of every day. And I think we both knew very early on that even though we loved that work in parts, we knew that the pace of it wasn't sustainable and that we both also really loved the outdoors. We loved hiking and backpacking. And I think only like our third date, we went on a multi-day backpacking trip together. So we knew that we would be much happier getting outdoors as much as possible and that that wasn't going to be possible with our careers as they were. So I think that's really where we started. And I think that's good people often will say like, oh, well, what does your partner or this person you're dating think about money? I think it's much more important to make sure that you align on the big life stuff. If you have the same vision for what is important in life and what you want out of life, you can figure out the money stuff. Money is just a tool. So it's just getting the alignment on the big picture things and then shaping your money behind that. But I think to more directly answer your question, I mean, we went through several years that we call the baller years where we thought, okay, we earn a decent living. We live in LA. We know we aren't going to have kids. Like, what are we saving this money for? And so we traveled a bunch. We ate at really nice restaurants. We were super into anything new and trendy. And we definitely spent plenty of money doing that. (laughs) 
But what made us stop that was once we figured out that we could save that money instead and buy our freedom in a relatively short period of time. And so we were just never going to be people who were going to save just to save, though we're super motivated once we felt like saving had a purpose. Then it became actually very easy to save mentally. It was a very easy mindset switch to make once we knew our why. So what was about your savings rate at the time that you guys were aggressively saving? Oh, this is um, one of those questions I don't like to answer anymore because we were very fortunate that we earned combined a very high income. So we each made six figures and combined that put us in our last earning years in about the top 3% of earning households. So I think it's safe to say it was a very high percent, but I'm also keenly aware that that was made possible almost entirely by just having that money as income. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, no, I totally understand not necessarily wanting to share the specific numbers of income because I mean, I actually am the same way. I don't come out and say how much I make, but I do make a, a point to say that my husband and I, we earn together a combined a good income. So totally fine. But I wanted to like talk a little bit about your move. So you were living in LA mm -hmm. and then where did you buy your house? Because you said you were kind of priced out of the market. Yeah, we bought a condo in LA back in 2009, but then we got a pretty magical opportunity early in 2011. Mark, when he had moved out to LA for us to be together, he was working from home. So he was working remotely for his DC job. I was still working for my DC-based company, but at our office in LA. And then in early 2011, because of the financial crisis and the aftershocks of that, my company closed our office. And so I was suddenly a remote worker as well. And we had this kind of incredible opportunity, both working from home, where we asked our companies, we said, hey, if we still have jobs, but we're working remotely, like, do we have to stay in LA? And they kind of both said, like, well, we can't really stop you if you want to move. So we said, great, we're moving to Tahoe. So we were able to buy what we call our retirement home in 2011 at pretty close to the low point of the market up here. And we moved at the start of 2012 and have been up here ever since. So it's not that we didn't love LA, we did, but we were able to get an actual house with four walls and just have a little bit more space and also be closer to the mountains, which we really decided was where we were happiest. And that's all been a good thing. I mean, it hasn't saved us a tremendous amount of money because Tahoe is still a very high cost of living area. But to us, that feels worthwhile. And it lets us do a lot of the things that we love for free, like hike and bike and even skiing. Once you buy a ski pass, it's much cheaper to do than people who are trying to buy like $150 day tickets. That's crazy. Mm. But the whole pass for the season will cost like $600. So you make that up pretty quickly. And I'm also assuming though, even though you said it's still a high cost of living where you are, you were able to not have to commute. So like you saved a lot of time, right? Like time on commuting and then expenses if you had commuting expenses before, which I think it's so important because that one or two hours or sometimes three, because my commute is more like three to four hours. Oh, wow. That's a lot of time. It, that's a lot of time to be able to either dedicate to a passion or a side hustle or something else, or just basically just not be stressed, right? Getting to and from work. Yeah. You know, it's interesting working from home. It has pros and cons for us. It worked out very much in our favor, but the flip side is you never leave the office if your home is the office. <laughs> right. And so there isn't that cue to go home and wrap things up at night. And so really from the first moment we woke up and our eyes were open in the morning, we were working until pretty close to the time we went to bed. So I would say it was wonderful not commuting. That definitely saved us money. We didn't need as many work clothes. So I really just needed a few outfits for work travel and I pretty much just recycled the same three or four outfits for years <laughs> when I traveled. Mm -hmm. So that all saved money for sure. But in our case, I think probably equated to just more time spent working. But it's still better to do that than just burn time in the car or on the train. Yeah, there is a benefit to leaving the house <laughs> and being able to work outside of your home <laughs> um, and change of scenery. Definitely can see yeah. that. <laughs> So what made you start Our Next Life? Because you guys are doing pretty well. You're saving now at being married. Did you start the blog before you moved to Tahoe or after you moved to Tahoe? Yeah, I started the blog after we were already up here. It was almost exactly at the midpoint of our savings journey. And that was not especially on purpose. It was just sort of I decided one day I wanted to do it because we had gotten 
to the point where for the first few years of saving, it was just very exciting. It just felt like a lot of milestones. We felt like we were really doing a great job hitting our targets. But then we sort of hit this point where it was like, oh, now it feels hard. It feels like a slog. We're getting impatient. Some days we really don't want to do the work in our jobs because we're dreaming of the next thing. And I wanted to have a record of that, you know, to not get to the end and forget what it had all felt like. And so I really just started the blog as a way to kind of capture some of those feelings and to be able to have something to look back on at the end. And it was a huge surprise that people actually wanted to read it. (laughs) So it very quickly turned into a much bigger part of my life than I think I anticipated at the time. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a little over three years old at this point. And oh my gosh, I love it so much. And I love the community. I mean, not just who read Our Next Life, but the whole kind of financial independence blog community. There's so many great people. And also, I think you and I have talked about this offline before. There are more women and more people of color. And we're starting to get more diversity in this space too. It's not just a bunch of like white dudes in tech. So I love it. It's great. You bring up a really good point about it can get very frustrating. It's almost like the gift and the curse. Once you awaken to this idea that you don't have to work forever and there's a possible way to build up your finances and that can afford you a life that you enjoy more, it's wonderful to have that awakening, but then sometimes it can get frustrating because depending on where you are doing the math, you figure, all right, wow, but this might take me five years, 10 years, 15 years, Mm -hmm. even 20 And then it gets kind of like, oh man, like I'm on year two. (laughs) Like I have Mm -hmm. 18 more years. And because I've definitely felt that I felt myself and I still get impatient about how long it will take, especially since some of my goals definitely have changed since starting Journey to Launch. So this is why the financial independence and podcast. So you, we didn't talk about this, but you have a podcast too. And like, so my podcast, podcasts like yours, resources are very important community because You can commiserate and celebrate with people who understand the journey and help keep you focused because it's really about staying focused and not giving up and not succumbing to maybe some negative thoughts. Like, what is the purpose of this? I might as well just go ball out and (laughs) Mm -hmm. buy something I really, which you can sometimes ball out, right? You can sometimes still buy things you like and spend money, but it's really important to have that community or that purpose. Like you created another purpose for yourself. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, I think it's really important to have purpose in your life. And for a lot of people, a job provides that. And when you subtract a job, there's often a void there or a vacuum. And it's important to think about that before you actually leave work and then just find yourself really aimless. And I've learned that through a lot of reader letters over time. A lot of folks who found themselves actually bored or kind of drifting and ended up going back to work, which to me would feel really tragic to save for all those years and then end up back at work anyway, because you could have done some nicer things in the meantime, if you were just going to end up working for your whole career regardless. But I think finding a community who can help support you and help remind you why you're doing this is so beneficial, even if it's virtual, even if it's people you never meet. I think there's so much value. And I feel so lucky to have accidentally stumbled into this great group. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads me into the topic I wanted to talk about, what is retirement? Because That's something that creates a lot of controversy sometimes, depending on who you're talking to, what it really means. And I think you bring up another good point where it's good to create something you can, quote unquote, retire into. So whether that's your own business, so, you know, technically you're still making money. And what I really find ironic is that most people who do end up reaching financial independence and retire from a corporate job end up making money and or a lot of money in their side hustle or their blog or just whatever they're working on that they were doing on side because they're passionate about it. And it allows them to, like you said, give them purpose. So I think one, it's important to figure out if that is your plan. Like you said, set yourself up so that you're not bored (laughs) once you're able to hit your goal, that you have something you love and you can do. But the next thing was about this early retirement definition. Mm -hmm. So you're retired, early retired, but what does that mean? Because some people say, well, you're still working, you're still earning income. So how can you be retired? Can you talk about that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is one of my favorite topics because people get so attached to a singular definition of this word. And the funny thing is retirement is actually still a very new concept in the history of human civilization. It only started about 150 years ago in Germany as a way to force out older workers because they were less efficient and they wanted to bring newer workers in to replace them. And then in the U.S., it's really only happened on a large scale in the last hundred years. And people don't necessarily know this, but the age 65 for Social Security and later Medicare 
was set by actuaries because they looked at where the math balanced out of having enough workers paying in to support the retirees. It wasn't because 65 is like some magic age or that it has any meaning beyond just the math people said it balanced out at that point. And we have this idea that 65 is when you're supposed to retire and that it's supposed to mean like sitting in a rocking chair or sitting on a beach with an umbrella drink and never doing anything again. And that's absurd. (laughs) We are people who have active minds, who are curious. And I think particularly people who are interested in early retirement, it's most often because you have other things you want to do with your life and other things you want to spend your time on. And that translates into having a drive to do something. And I will also say now being on the other side of it, it's amazing once you take away the necessity to work, how much more fun work can actually feel if it's work that you truly enjoy and are truly choosing to do. And there's no element of having to do it because you need the money. It feels entirely different. But I will back up and answer your question, which is to say, retirement can essentially mean whatever you want it to. I think if you've left your primary career and you don't need money anymore, you can call yourself retired if you feel retired. I mean, I think that the thing that I feel now more than I've ever felt before, certainly I never felt it while I was planning for early retirement because I just don't think you can until you get there. But I realized retirement for me is totally a state of mind. And I know that sounds like woo-woo. And Mm -hmm. obviously, if you say, well, I feel retired, but I have no money saved, it doesn't work in that case. But to me, it's a feeling of freedom of knowing that if something came along tomorrow and it sounded super interesting, I could say yes to it and I almost wouldn't even care how much it paid. Or if something wants to pay me $10 million, but it doesn't sound interesting, I can say no and not hesitate. I would say in our case this year, we have been doing a tiny bit of work, primarily because Mark got an opportunity to do a passion project, and I did too. And given where the markets have been on this record long bull run and the recent volatility, we just suspect that we might hit a bad sequence of returns, which for folks who look at the numbers of retirement or early retirement know that can be the quickest thing that sinks your budget. So We just decided to say yes to those opportunities, but it's a pretty minimal amount of work. But it is truly interesting how many people get worked up about that and say like, oh, well, you're not retired because you're working at all. I'm like, okay, so if I go do one paid speaking gig for one day and I make enough money to cover a quarter of the year, you're telling me I can't call myself retired because I worked for one day? (laughs) I think I can. But I just really think you should define your retirement however you want to. You don't have to use the word if you don't want. Some people prefer to say financially independent or they prefer to say semi-retired, whatever. Use the word that feels right for you. For us, we feel retired. We feel like we left those careers behind. Now we're just doing the stuff that fires us up and also not working most days. And so we feel like retirement fits us really well. But you get to pick yours. That guy over there, he gets to pick his. If you're retired and you feel that way, don't let anybody tell you you're not retired. Right, right. Because everyone will have an opinion. I like to say when I say that I want to retire, I usually say I'm retiring from my corporate job into something I want to do or love to do. That's kind of sometimes how I frame it for people who want to get technical with me about what early retirement means. (laughs) I think that's totally fair. But I also think for years when people would say, oh, do you have kids? I would sort of do the, oh, not yet. Or, you know, I would kind of equivocate a little bit because I felt like Society expects people to have kids and it's a little bit weird to say you don't. But when I finally owned that I didn't want to have kids and started responding with more confidence, you know, they say, do you have kids? I go, nope. (laughs) (laughs) I found that that didn't give them room to argue with me. And so I've been doing the same thing with retirement when people say like, oh, what do you do? I go, I just retired. (laughs) Right. I find that I'm not getting all those like, oh, well, what are you going to do? And aren't you bored? And I don't get those questions. So I do think for folks who struggle with this, say it with confidence. It works. Good point. You actually talk about phases Mm -hmm. of your financial independence plan. And I wanted to touch upon that, like what those phases were. You talked about phase one, two, and three. So how did you break down your journey into those phases? Yeah, great question. So a lot of folks will really focus on saving just kind of one pool of money. And In theory, that sounds good, but it does get a little complicated if you have some of it, let's say in 401k or IRA funds or 403b or Canada has different versions of things where you can't legally touch that money without a tax penalty until you reach a certain age, usually 59 and a half or 60. And there are ways, of course, you can do the Roth conversions where you can get at some of that money earlier, but it gets complicated and there are five-year waiting periods and all these details to think about. 
we decided, because as I mentioned earlier, we didn't start from scratch. We did have some money already in 401ks. We decided to actually treat our retirement as two different things. So if we kept saving as we had been in our traditional retirement accounts, that we could essentially leave that money alone and let that be there for our traditional retirement. And then we could funnel a big chunk of our savings into taxable investments, like basically just index funds. But then we also ended up buying a rental property. So that will kick out some passive income in a few years that that would fund our early retirement phase. And so we actually decided to build those into two completely different pots of money and save them that way, which I think does a few things. Like for those who already have retirement funds saved in some way, it gives you a bigger pile of money there for later, which gave me a huge amount of peace of mind because I have some health problems in my family. I know that I already have some genetic challenges that I deal with. So I've always wanted to have a lot of money set aside for my later years for healthcare needs or just given like all the healthcare uncertainty in the US, especially right now. I think it's smart for everyone to have extra padding. But the other thing was by having a bigger pool set aside for later and a slightly leaner pool for our early retirement, we knew that even if we screwed up and burned all our money, we wouldn't be in bad shape when we're 80, 90 years old. And it's not so easy to just go hustle and find more money if you need it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was very much like a peace of mind thing. And then I think for Mark, it was a practical thing. It was like, we don't want to have to deal with tax penalties and restrictions on what we can access when. So let's just keep this simple and have unrestricted money for the early years and use the restricted stuff later on. It's really just separating out into buckets or sections in your head and also obviously in real life Mm -hmm. about when you would need the money. So are you more than conservative in your retirement accounts versus your taxable accounts? We're relatively aggressive in our allocations in both. And it's funny because, you know, 401ks are individual. So Mark's is almost 100% stock. Mine is like 60% stock, 40% bonds. It's way more conservative than his is. But then our, 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 index fund investments that are for the early retirement phase are basically 70, 30 stocks to bonds. But again, all index funds, so broadly diversified. Um, The other thing I'll say, though, is that we made sure that when we retired, we had three years worth of expenses in cash. So we have a big buffer where if stocks really tank or bonds are yielding nothing, we don't have to sell shares for quite an extended period. So the idea is that as we're sending, as we're spending cash, we're generally selling shares and replenishing the cash stockpile. But then if the market goes south, then we can hold off on selling for a little bit. So was the saving three years of expenses phase one? That is to fund phase one, although I suspect we'll probably keep multiple years of expenses in the later traditional retirement phase as well. Saving the cash was the very last thing we did. So we had like an emergency fund that we always had and a life happens fund. That's very Susie Orman, one of my early (laughs) financial mentors. But we didn't do all the big cash until the end because you guys know, but like cash in a savings account doesn't grow very much. And we wanted to make sure that we gave our money as much time as possible to grow. So we focused on investments first and savings last. Okay. So you focused on building those up so it had more time to grow over time and then worked on the immediate needs at the end or towards the end of your hustle. So curious to know when, so now if you do make any money or do you save anything anymore or is it really just to cover more expenses? How do you buffer or replenish at this point when you do get income? I suspect it's going to evolve a bit. The blogger JD Roth who writes Get Rich Slowly recently did a really fascinating post that I think is worth checking out where he mapped out, he's now been early retired for many years, but he mapped out how much they had spent each year and it fluctuates really dramatically. I think that people like to talk about the 4% rule, like you're always going to spend the same amount every year. And I just know for us, that just isn't true. If we have a year where we don't really travel that much, we'd probably spend very little. But then in another year, if we take a couple international trips, we might spend, relatively speaking, a ton or we might have a year where we want to renovate our kitchen or buy an RV. So I think we're still keeping the door open very much. If we earned a little more than we intended to because we got sucked into some work that we loved, we probably would sock some of that money away in an IRA or two just for the tax benefits, but also to add some more padding for later. But we saved enough so that we don't ever have to work again. And so that's assuming that we wouldn't save more. But I have no idea. You know, we're just going to see how, how that yeah. part goes. See how, no, it makes total sense. And you actually brought up something I think is really important, healthcare mm-hmm. consideration. So right now, what are you guys doing for healthcare? 
Gosh, yeah. Healthcare is something that we think a lot about. Mark has an autoimmune disease and I've got a genetic thing. And also just like, I'm one of those people who's just always sick. So it has always been top of mind for us. And it was actually tied to our timing. So the reason we didn't retire at the end of 2016 is that we knew that the next president after Obama was going to have a big say in what happened with healthcare. And so we wanted to give it a full year after the election to shake out. You know, we didn't know certainly that Trump was going to be elected and that it was going to be as uncertain as it all is. But we do right now have an Affordable Care Act exchange plan that we bought off the exchange. In our state, California, there is a specific state exchange, but it's pretty comparable to what you'd buy in most states. And it looks mostly like regular insurance. It has a slightly narrower provider network than we expected, given that it's on Blue Shield, which is, a you know, obviously a huge nationwide carrier and network. But otherwise, yeah, it just feels like normal insurance. But we're keeping every finger and toe crossed that some version of the health insurance exchange sticks around because I think that is not a sure thing at the moment. Mm -hmm. So is that expense in line or more than what you used to pay when it was supported by a corporate job or your private job? It's a little bit less because it's all adjusted for income and our income is relatively low now, but it's a little bit more than we had planned to pay. It's worth doing your homework if you're looking at those types of plans to really dig into the details. We had originally planned to get a much cheaper insurance plan, but then the drug coverage on it was really terrible. And Mark's meds, he's not that sick, but even his not that serious drug costs $1,000 a month generic without insurance. And so we ended up going with a slightly more expensive plan to have better drug coverage, which is great because now it's $15 a month. So well worth it. But I would say with the income adjustment, it's probably comparable to most employer plans. It's one of the things where even if you're not thinking about retiring early, even if it's just maybe a career switch or you want to take some time off using FU money to follow a passion, mm -hmm. it's one of the things that holds people back is that but if I quit my job, like I don't have the health care, it's going to increase our expenses by X amount or my husband doesn't have or my wife doesn't have the health care that we need. Health care is just such a big component of the whole financial situation because you really have to take that into account on what you're planning for in life. So I think it's pretty important that people do the research, but that there are some options out there that could be beneficial or maybe it's not as expensive as you think. I think that's right. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more. It's so important to plan for. And it's good to start early thinking about that. If you think you might make a switch in the next year or two, just look at the exchange, run it based on your anticipated income and just kind of get a sense of things. And that'll help you start thinking about it. All right. And I wanted to definitely touch upon a blog post that you wrote a little while back about what fire bloggers owe their readers, because I thought it was such a good blog post talking about the fact that we have to be realistic. So bloggers, podcasters, whoever is in this FI space about where our readers are coming from, just how to talk and how to reach them. I mean, I really would just like you to talk a little bit about that. And it did get a lot of feedback, right? Like you got <laughs> a bunch of comments and <laughs> people chiming in, but can you talk a little bit about what that blog post was about? Yeah. The financial independence and early retirement blog community has tended to really focus on encouraging people and helping to make early retirement feel really accessible to the masses. And on some level, I agree with that. And I think that that's really admirable. You know, we don't want to feel like this exclusive little club that only the rarefied few can join. There are plenty of examples of people being able to retire early with kids, not earning six figures, single people in expensive places. So there are plenty of case studies that show that this is something that a lot of different people can do. But what I think often happens is that in an effort to make this feel accessible, or let's be honest, sometimes just to get clicks or to create a sexy headline, people sometimes present the facts in a certain way or misrepresent the facts. I think it's generally not something that people do intentionally, but what you see is folks will talk about their income as being middle class or average when it's clearly not. And intentionally or unintentionally misleading readers that way. Or you'll see things like people retiring, but then having side income, let's say from their blog, and then not talking about that fact with readers, which that's less to me. Like I think some people read that as me saying that you don't get to call yourself retired if you're working. That could not be farther from the truth. I think, again, you get to call yourself retired if you feel retired. 
But it's more the idea that let's say that your blog is covering all of your expenses. Well, then you're not actually testing out, let's say, the 4% rule or whatever safe withdrawal rate you've elected to use. And so now if you're writing posts that are saying like, hey, I think people shouldn't worry about hitting your magic number, you know, hey, retire before you hit your number or just be confident in your ability to earn more money in the future. I think that that's potentially misleading people and sending them down a dangerous road because a lot of people do follow the idea of early retirement with the belief that they'll never have to work again. And so we shouldn't be giving them advice of saying you can never work again But, oh, yeah, this advice I'm giving you is contingent on you earning more money in the future and not disclosing to them that the reason we feel so optimistic or the reason that we don't feel like there's big risk in it is because, oh, yeah, we have all this other padding of blog income or whatever it is. So I think it's all coming from a good hearted place for most bloggers of just wanting to be more welcoming and wanting to bring more people into the fold and help more people kind of see this secret that we all feel like we've discovered together But I do think it's important to be super transparent about your own circumstances, about your own income bracket, even if you don't disclose actual numbers and the privilege and boosts that you've gotten along the way. I think that stuff is important to disclose, too, because if you're trying to make people who come out of school with $100,000 in debt feel like they are idiots, if they can't do this, too, you need to tell them that, hey, you yourself didn't actually have any debt. And that's why you could do this so quickly. So that's a lot of thoughts. But... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was mm-hmm. what was all behind me writing that post. And I like that because as I started my journey and I started sharing my information, I've always shied away from sharing my actual income. And I know you don't share your income either or what you actually save or your actual points. And for me, part of that is just like privacy. But then I also knew that me saying that I saved now it's 169000 in two years. I started to say it was 50% of what we were making because and I feel like anyone could do the math on that and that's over two years but I realized the importance of giving the full picture but it also has to be in a place that you feel comfortable as the giver of the information so I totally agree that you should be upfront and more people should be upfront with the audience and whether that's sharing numbers or not but saying like you said okay but you know I didn't have this much debt or at least acknowledging where maybe their readers or listeners are coming from. I think that's actually a really big part of it is pretending to not see the discrepancies or the pitfalls that people are probably in. And the starting points is just, I think, a disservice and kind of makes people end up feeling bad, not good when you start sharing the message. Yeah. And you brought up several things there that I think are are really important. One is I do think if you spend a lot of your time thinking about early retirement, reading other FI blogs, reading money books, spending time with people at a similar income bracket as you, it becomes very easy to get into a bubble and just to forget that your circumstances may not be normal. When we were working in DC and working in LA, we were surrounded by lots of people who were in a similar income bracket as us. And it would have been very easy to forget like, oh, actually, this is not the norm. And Americans have such a complicated relationship with the term middle class, where there's research that says even 50% of people in the top 1% of earners see themselves as middle class. So... (laughs) Everybody likes to use that label when it actually only applies to about half of the people. And it's important, I think, to stay grounded in that and to understand that most people are not going to be able to save the kind of percents that a lot of fire bloggers save. And it doesn't mean you have to teach people how to get food stamps. You know, I got that comment a few times that I was suggesting we need to cater to every income level. I think it's fine to write for a particular audience, but you just need to be clear about what that is or what that takes. And I think that You also raised the point about savings percentage. I think sometimes it's wise to actually hold back some of the numbers. If you're not going to give the whole picture, maybe give even less of it in that sense. Because savings percentage, in my experience, is really just something that I think shames a lot of readers. They will look at that and go, wow, I was saving 40%. And I thought that was really good. But then I saw that this other blogger was saving 50 or 60, 70, 80, whatever it is. Now I feel like I'm not doing that well. But then they find, oh, well, that person actually earned $400,000 in their household. And so, of course, they could save that percent. So I think savings percent is great if you share your total income or you're, you're sharing your total numbers. But otherwise, I actually think it's okay to hold back some of that and just talk about, you know, we were able to do these big things because we earned well above average. And that's the piece that we need to be acknowledging or kind of acknowledging if you're in a high earning percentage, giving people some sense of that so they don't think that if they can't save 70% of their income on a $50,000 salary that they aren't failures. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons my work and my message, I feel like, is evolving and how I choose to position myself and share the information. But one of the things that I feel like Journey to Launch does is it introduces a lot of people to the financial independence movement and a more diverse audience at that. And so I'm very proud of that. And some of my listeners are high earners, some are mid earners, some are still low earners and working their way up. And they just have this inspiration and drive that they see it's possible, right? Like there's something else out there other than what they thought or what they saw in their immediate circle or reality. Absolutely. There's a gap, I feel. And there's so much more people <laughs> that need to hear <laughs> this. It's funny because I interviewed Vicki Robin of Your Money or Your Life a couple months ago. And we talked about how when she was doing her work, a lot of people didn't end up reaching financial dependence, but the changes that they made just along the journey, it was so transformative to their life. It was even just getting out of debt or building a savings account. So even if they weren't able to retire early by the time they reached a certain point, their lives changed for the better. And so it was better to reach for the stars and the moon and end up maybe a little further below versus not doing anything at all, which I think is another pretty important message for people to hear. I completely agree with that. And at every point in our journey, we have felt like even if we didn't get all the way to the end of it, if we just got to this point where we are, let's say two or three years before being able to retire early, we would have felt so much more at peace, so much more in control of our lives. So 100% agree with Vicky and agree with you. And I also agree that you should be proud. I think this podcast is a great service to people and I'm so glad you're doing it. And I'm so glad you're a voice in our space. And I absolutely want to encourage people. I think it's just important to give the context so that people don't get to that place where they're really encouraged and they start saving and then they look at it and they go, wait a minute, I'm not actually good enough. Like, no, you are good enough. <laughs> All that matters is your progress against where you were, not your progress against some person on the internet. You're, yeah, totally, totally right. So as we close out, do you have any practical advice for people who want to start the path, who are maybe hearing this for the first time or who are already on the path, whether it is that they're a high earner or if they're like a mid to low earner, is there a difference of advice to give either one of those groups or not really? No, I think the best advice that I have, I do think really applies across everybody. And it's to make sure that you're not saving so much and in such a focused way that your life today is one that you don't enjoy. None of us are promised tomorrow. None of us are promised next year. All this crazy stuff could happen that could prevent us from being able to reach our goals. And if in the meantime, you've made yourself miserable, you haven't let yourself do anything that you enjoy or spend money on things that are meaningful to you or spend money on people you care about, you're ultimately going to be unhappy with that. And it's also, to your point earlier, this journey sometimes takes many, many years. And so you want to make sure that your life in the meantime is also a good life. And I think that applies to every single person but I think if we were going to go a step beyond that, I would say my best advice, I think what worked for us, especially as non-frugal people, if you're just naturally a superstar saver, good for you. I'm jealous of you. <laughs> that was not <laughs> us. But if you're not, don't feel like you have to cut a million things or cut everything at once. Focus on just a couple of little things that you've identified in your spending that once you started tracking where all your money's going, you said, you know what, this thing doesn't actually bring me joy. That'd be okay to lose. This thing, you know what, that is fun to buy, but then ultimately I forget about it. So I'll cut that out. Just focus on one or two things and then track your net worth. And it's amazing how motivating seeing those numbers grow can be where you save a little bit and you save a little bit and then suddenly that stuff starts to add up and then you go, you know what? I'd like to see that add up faster. Maybe I can cut a little more. And then suddenly when you have that perspective, it becomes so much easier to trim things that maybe felt like a really essential need just a few months or a few years before but I think going slowly, making those cuts gradually instead of trying to give away everything, those points are kind of complementary. But it's sort of how to make it sustainable and how to make your life one that you enjoy in the meantime and one where you don't feel like you're suffering or you've sacrificed everything to get to that goal. Because if you make yourself unhappy in the meantime and then you get to this end place as an unhappy person, the life that comes after that isn't going to be one you're going to enjoy either. So that's my best advice. Now, that's really good advice. It's about the journey. I mean, the launch is fun and it's good to look forward to, but you got to make sure the journey you're learning from it, it's the longest and best part of it. It's the whole process. So thank you so much, Tanya, for coming on the podcast. Where can journeyers find you, listen to you? Where can they connect more? 
they can find everything on my website, ournextlife.com. And there I have links to social. I use Twitter the most, but you can find me on Instagram and Facebook as well. And I also have a podcast with my co-host, Kara Perez, called The Fairer Sense, which is very different, not just about FI and that whole thing, but really just about women and money and kind of some of the stuff we're up against in our efforts to get equal with money. Kara is about eight years younger than me, I think. So we have different generational perspectives and it's a lot of fun. I had her on the show too. So my listeners are familiar with her. So thank you so much, Tanya, for coming on again. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun and such an honor to be on your great show. I really hope you enjoyed that talk with Tanya. If you want any of the links that we discussed, you can go to the episode show notes at journeytolaunch.com slash episode 52. Hope you were inspired and invigorated by that conversation as much as I was. And again, I hope this is helping you on your journey. Matter of fact, I know this is helping you because I get such good feedback and great responses when I do episodes, specifically episodes with people who have reached financial independence, who are well on their way, that this has inspired you. And so I hope this is just another one to continue to keep the fuel going, right? To give you that energy, that motivation to keep on your journey. Don't forget to connect with me on social media so you can share your thoughts in the episode. I value your feedback. So I love when the episode comes out and I get a comment or a DM or a message that says something about the episode that you liked a certain part of it or you even wanted to learn more about maybe a person's part of the story, right? Any feedback is helpful for me. So continue to do that. And so I'm interested to hear what you think of this episode. So don't forget to just tell me, right? Post it on your social media if you like it. Tell other people about it and continue to share the podcast. Remember, you can find me on all social media as Journey to Launch, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Join the private Facebook community at journeytolaunch.com slash community. And until next week, journeyers, keep on journeying. Bye. Bye.